We'll take a look now at anointing of the sick in the time period between the Council of Florence, right before the Protestant Reformation, through the Council of Trent. Um, and here, um, you know, if you saw if you saw in the scholastic period, you saw a lot of the the um, systematic the theology being worked out. We really get the dogmatic uh, definitions of the Church um, flowing from Florence into the Council of Trent. So recall the Council of Florence is 1439. Um, there, are, there are these declarations that if certain churches from the East want to come back in union with Rome, they need to say certain things about the sacraments. Um, and uh, again, these are not thought to be dogmatically binding, um, but they are a snapshot of where the church was right before the Protestant Reformation. And the, um, where the church is on the sacraments is a thoroughly Thomistic um, understanding of the sacraments. So without quoting it, Florence uh, says a few things about um, anointing of the sick. It, la it lists extreme unction as the fifth of the sacraments. Its matter is olive oil blessed by a priest. And the sacrament should not be given to the sick unless death is expected. So um, I, I suppose that can go without commentary. That's just the full flowering of the medieval period we saw. The person is to be anointed on the following places. On the eyes for sight on the ears for hearing, on the nostrils for smell, on the mouth for taste or speech, on the hands for touch, on the feet for walking, and on the loins for the pleasure that abides there. By the way, I'm pretty glad the church no longer anoints on the loins. I, I'm guessing you can all appreciate that as well. The form for the sacrament um, is, through this anointing and this uh, his most pious mercy, May the Lord pardon you whatever you have done wrong by sight or similarly for the other members. So, uh, for instance, through this anointing and his most pious mercy, may the Lord pardon you for whatever you, wrong you have done um, by mouth or speech. Right. So uh, the same formula, slightly uh, modified for each of the senses. The minister of the sacraments is a priest. The effect is to cure the mind and insofar as it helps the soul, also the body. Um, so the, the, um, the effects here aren't very robust. We'll see in the Council of Trent, it gives a very uh, well-rounded or robust um, ex explanation of the effects of the sacrament. And all of this is supported by quoting James 5. That moves us into some of the Protestant reformers. The reformers as a whole rejected anointing of the sick as a sacrament, their main reason being its absence in the Bible as explicitly um, instituted by Christ. Uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin both denied that the reference in James could be used to support extreme unction. Uh, Luther thought that James was speaking about anointing for healing, but he says scholastics only spoke about anointing for dying. So he's already, he's just looking at the uh, difference between what he sees in scripture, anointing for healing, and practice, anointing for dying. So he's pointing to the church to some of its inconsistencies with its own scriptures. Uh, for Luther, even though anointing was not a sacrament of Christ, it could be considered a sacrament of the church, or maybe not this language, but the kind of thing we would call a sacramental, like holy water. Those uh, who, for, for Luther, those who receive it in faith could experience peace of soul, forgiveness of sins, but it had to be remembered that the consolation came not from any power in the right, but as a result of their confidence in God and their faith in his mercy. Calvin, for his part, dismissed anointing as, quote, hypocritical play acting by which priests tried to make themselves look like the apostles. So for Calvin, um, anointing in James 5 was a miraculous gift of healing, which had been given to the church at the beginning to draw attention to the power of God in preaching the gospel, but no kind of ongoing sacrament in the church. So, of course, the Council of Trent responds in several, uh, in a decree in several canons. Um, talks about extreme unction as the completion of penance and of the whole Christian life. So it's put as a kind of bookend um, in, the, in uh, the, the life of penance at the end. Trent says, For though our adversary seeks and seizes opportunities all our life long to be able in any way to devour our souls, yet is there no time wherein he strains more vehemently all the powers of his craft to ruin us utterly, and if he can possibly to make us fall even from trust in the mercy of God than when he perceives the end of our life to be at hand. So Trent is saying uh, this is a, a particular time at which 
Satan is after us, and therefore we need a particular moment of grace, and so we have this sacrament. Uh, Trent said, now this sacred unction or anointing of the sick was instituted by Christ our Lord as truly and properly a sacrament of the new law, insinuated indeed in Mark, but recommended and promulgated to the faithful by James the Apostle and the brother of the Lord. So it's affirmed that it is instituted by Christ without telling us exactly where, but we know it's promulgated by James. The matter of the sacrament is oil blessed by a bishop. Uh, quote, for the unction very aptly represents the grace of the Holy Ghost, with which the soul of the sick person is invisibly anointed. And furthermore, those words, by this unction, etc., what we saw from Florence, are the form. Now, the effects of the sacrament, uh, this should be noted. This uh, Mentally make a note of this slide. In the Council of Trent, you find probably the most robust, uh, the fullest description of the effects of the anointing of the sick up to this point, and perhaps even since. So what does the sacrament of anointing of the sick do? For the thing here is the, uh, sorry, the thing here signified is the grace of the Holy Ghost. So there's a particular grace of the Holy Spirit given. Whose anointing cleanses away sins if there be any still to be expiated, as also the remains of sin, right? So uh, it's kind of taking up um, um, both the Franciscan and the Dominican. It's all sins and the remains of sin are taken care of by anointing of the sick and raises up and strengthens the soul of the sick person by ex exciting in him a great confidence in the divine mercy, whereby the sick being supported bears more easily the inconveniences and pains of his sickness and more readily resists the temptations of the devil who lies in wait for his heel. And finally, at times obtains bodily health when expedient for the welfare of the soul. So this is really a, a well-rounded um, well-rounded, robust is the word I keep wanting to use, a full vision of all of the effects of the sacrament of anointing of the sick. It says that the proper minister of this sacrament are the presbyters of the church, by which are, are understood in that place, not the elders by age, right? Not presbyters by, you know, they're the oldest, um, or the foremost in dignity among the people, but either bishops or priests, uh, by priests, by bishops rightly ordained by the imposition of the hands of the priesthood. So this uh, this one is trying to get around um, some of the Protestant objections that presbyter just means elder. And this is saying, no, uh, the minister of this is a, uh, an ordained priest. This unction, it says, is to be applied to the sick, but to those especially who lie in such danger as to be, uh, to seem to be about to depart this life. Whence also is the sacrament, whence also is it called the sacrament of the departing? Um, so there's there's a little bit of a walk back here or, or a tempering of the, the medieval notion that this is the sacrament for those in the moment of death. Now it says it's to be applied to the sick, but especially those who are about to depart this life. Uh, we'll see that this movement back towards just the sick or um, away from the moment of death continues, uh, especially in the 20th century. Um, after Trent... The, this medieval question about whether children should receive the sacrament was settled really by practice rather than by decree in the 17th century when it became customary to anoint only those who had reached the age of discretion. Um, the only theological question about extreme unction that remained open was a minor one concerning those effects of the sacrament. Uh, the bishops at Trent saw no, no compelling reason to accept either the Dominican or the Franciscan explanation to the exclusion of the other. And so they declared that the sacrament had the power both to forgive sins and to remove the remnants of sin, which we saw. And finally, Pope Benedict XIV perceived that the question was truly moot and getting nowhere. So in 1747, he made a plenary indulgence available to all those who were anointed. So uh, he basically settles it. It, practically speaking, doesn't matter because now uh, there's an indulgence anyway. Therefore, there would be no doubt that those who received the sacrament with the proper disposition were fully absolved from their sins and any punishment that was due for them, um, making therefore there be nothing standing in the way of such a person entering to heaven after death. Uh, that will take us actually, we'll skip all the way up to the contemporary period in the 20th century in our next and final video.